Hello there. Welcome to a brand new episode of Talk Music Talk with Boys. I am Boys. I'm your podcasting host. Thank you so much for checking out the podcast. If this happens to be your very first time listening, Talk Music Talk is a weekly music interview podcast where I have long form conversations with people connected to music from different genres and different backgrounds, both established and emerging singers, singer songwriters, music therapists, music journalists. And on this new episode, I had the pleasure of speaking to a wonderful author, Maureen Mann. She has a wonderful book out, came out late last year. It is called Black Diamond Queens, subtitled African American Women and Rock and Roll. It traces the presence and importance and influence of black women in the rock and roll era. Kicks off with Big Mama Thornton, who sang the original version of Hound Dog and continues through other pioneers like Laverne Baker, the Shirelles, and of course, my favorite, Tina Turner, who also graces the cover. Also features sections on prominent background singers like Mary Clayton. Plus, there are chapters on Betty Davis and LaBelle. The book is wonderful. It is informative and compulsive to read on both the celebrated and unsung black women and their role in rock and roll. In this conversation, we discuss all of these incredible women. Plus, we talk about the current crop who are making music in the rock and roll field. Also, Maureen is the author of Right to Rock, which is subtitled The Black Rock Coalition and the Cultural Politics of Race. Both of her books are available from Duke University Press. We kick off talking about the Tina Turner documentary on HBO, which was just nominated for three Emmys, including one for Outstanding Documentary Special. You should definitely check it out. I've already watched it five times since I've had this conversation with Maureen. Here it is without further ado, my conversation with Maureen Mann. Enjoy. And the Tina documentary a few weeks ago, we have both watched it. So your thoughts? Well, I have to say I was surprised at how moved I was by the documentary because I'm familiar with her story. I've read her memoir. I've watched the movies. I've done a lot of research on her. And so I thought that I had developed a certain amount of, I don't know what to call it. I guess in our context, I'll say like immunity to some of, Mm -hmm. you know, the struggle. Like I just recognize that that's part of her story, but there's something about the way that they put the documentary together. And I think also having, hearing her voice actually describe some of the things that were happening to her in that relationship with Ike really got me. And then the way they framed the story to talk about how the survivor story becomes another kind of burden for her and the constant need to go back over the details of her hardship becomes this burden. And I just, I was so moved by that. And, um, it really stayed with me in a way that I I didn't Mm -hmm. expect. So I I thought it was very well done. And I loved all of the archival footage that they have. Anytime you can watch Tina Turner perform, you know, (laughs) it's a good thing. So yeah. What what did you think about it? No, I felt the same because it's like, I've read the books multiple times, seen the movies. And it's like, you know, to hear the people interview, the interview from people magazines where, you know, you, from 1981, right. you hear her talking about everything directly. And you realize that, okay, she left in 76 and the interview is 81. So it was still pretty, Fresh. you know, close to when yeah. it happened. Yeah. So I like that. And yeah, the emotional content, I have uh, multiple viewings and like each time. <laughs> it's like, I know it's going to happen. You watched it more than once, you're saying? <laughs> I've watched it four times. Because <laughs> it's one of those things. I watched it when it, you know, the first time they aired it, like that Saturday night. Mm-hmm. And it finished and I was like, I could watch this again right now. I, I was ready to just, you know, start watching it again. So yeah. I think it's, I mean, part of it is Tina Turner. She, I, she's such a phenomenal artist and such a phenomenal figure. But I really, my, my hat is off to the filmmakers because there's a kind of music bio documentary that they're mm. always, you know, they're interesting, they're informative, but there's a kind of formula. And yeah. they didn't do that they really broke away from that and in mm-hmm. really smart ways. And um, I was, I yeah. was really moved and, 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 yeah. and, and as I say, I was surprised, but uh, 
Yeah, I recommend yeah, yeah. it. I think it. <laughs> yes, everyone should see it multiple times. Uh, <laughs> and I think it's a great way to move into the book because she's one of the uh, women that you feature in the book. But it also speaks maybe the reason why it was so touching is that there isn't much scholarship on Tina Turner in general, which you talk about in right, the book. Right, right. So I'm an academic. And so I'm always looking for people in my field to, you know, join in the conversation because I think that these artists, these African-American women artists are so important. And part of the way that we measure importance is by giving them scholarly attention, you know, so uh, Mm -hmm. she's someone who I think, and there are many other women who I think really need to have some more time spent on them to talk about their careers Uh, And especially to talk about their music, their musical sound and their influence, because it's really made such an imprint on American and global music. And paying scholarly attention to these women is a way to give them credit for Mm -hmm. this creative labor that they've they've done. And that, you know, I think we all enjoy. Like, we listen to this music. It's part of our soundtrack. And um, so, yeah, that's one of the things I appreciate about the documentary um, that it was bringing attention to her. Although I will say, there's still room for another documentary about Tina Turner, yeah. her, you know, her music and her influence, which they, they don't really talk mm-hmm. about so much in the film. Yeah, yeah. Is that something you see? Because I've like when I've inter- interviewed uh, female artists, uh, the, you know, they have said that you know a lot of times you're asked about everything but exactly. the music, and, and you probably saw this in your research of her. Like the articles would be about mm-hmm. Ike or you know her legs. Uh, Tina, 50 right, and fabulous. Right, right. Tina, defying age and like very little yeah. was, you know, they say the powerful voice, yeah. but very little was actually on right. her music. Right, the soul survivor, you know, the S-O-U-L, yeah, yeah. soul survivor. But I, I do mm-hmm. think that's a problem that um, that women have. And we get really caught up in their narratives, uh, their life stories. And, and the life stories are often really interesting. So I understand yeah. it and I, I, I do that myself. But I think we have to remember like the reason we're talking about them is because of the music. I mean, that's the thing that has really drawn us in. And then we learn about this mm-hmm. other stuff. Um, and, yeah. and I think get sidetracked from it, sidetracked with it in a way that doesn't happen with male performers, male artists, you know, like how much do you know about the details of the, you know, the marriages and, you know, relationships of many of the male artists where they become, the centerpiece of discussions Mm -hmm. uh, about women artists. Like if you think of someone like Billie Holiday and what kinds of narratives get told about her and, you know, just listen to her recordings. That that's where the real Mm -hmm. story is. So I do, I do think that's an issue that um, I think there's work coming out now, scholarly work that's, Mm -hmm. that that is doing this uh, emphasis Mm -hmm. on the creativity and the art and the impact on, you know, on, culture so it's it's happening yeah it's definitely happening. yeah yeah did you see your book as a corrective or what was the genesis of the book for me it? it was partly i was just curious about these stories because i I'm, I'm someone who grew up listening to rock and always listened to it you know listening to it as an african-american with an understanding that oh this is this is like white people's music um, and yeah, fortunately, yeah. I had a, a parent. My mom was like, well, no, you know, rock and roll is Chuck Berry and Little Richard, you know, so she was trying <laughs> to set me straight. But at the time I was listening uh, in the late 70s and the early 80s, you couldn't, it was hard to see that. Uh, it was yeah. really, it had really become a white music form. And I was listening to rock radio stations and every once in a while they'd play Jimi Hendrix. But for the most part, it was, it was white mm-hmm. artists. So... I started getting interested in, well, we're, you know, it is a black form. So what about black women? Were black women involved mm. in this form and who were they? And I knew some of the names, but I didn't know a lot of details about them. And then mm-hmm. once I started learning about them, it became like, oh, there needs to be a corrective because there are these people who were here at the beginning and with someone like Big Mama Thornton, you know, there before there was even the name rock and roll who were shaping mm-hmm. the form but haven't really gotten their due. So that was, those were the okay. kind of ideas that, that pushed me to, to focus and, and research and write the book. Okay. When did you uh, start the writing? And oh, I think it was about a hundred years ago. I've been doing it for a long time. 
<laughs> give, give or take. Or take. <laughs> yeah. um, well, I, I had done a previous book on the Black Rock Coalition. Yeah. And so I was learning a lot about just the history of popular music by being in conversation with those musicians. Um, and then very early on, so probably in like 2004, I started researching Mary Clayton because yeah. I was, you know, listening to all this rock music and suddenly it hit me, wait, there are all these black women on these, on these records <laughs> or it sounded like black women. You know, had to find yeah. out if that was the case. And so Mary Clayton was just one of the most important um, of the background singers from the late 1960s. And so I started, you know, by looking at the song Gimme Shelter by the Rolling Stones, which she has this amazing vocal on. It's really like a duo uh, more yeah. than, uh, you know, a, a background voice. And just started following her. And then also... Um, I started doing work on just trying to sketch out who were all of the women who might be in a book about black women and rock and roll. Mm -hmm. So that that's when I started. And then in about 2012 or 13, I got a fellowship where I was able to take a year and really do some deep focus. So I feel like that's oh, okay. when I really started like mm -hmm. digging into the archives in a more systematic way, listening and listening and listening to music mm -hmm. and then doing, doing the writing. But yeah, it took a long, okay. it took a long time. I can't take, <laughs> I this, I can't take this long next time. But <laughs> were there uh, is there things that stand out that you didn't know before your research? There are a lot of things. I mean, there's like juicy gossip. Like I didn't know that Mick Jagger's oldest child is a, a, a daughter that he had with an African American woman, a woman named Marsha. Yeah, Hunt. I so I had never heard mm -hmm. of her. And one day I mm -hmm. was, you know, as I was going through stuff, I don't even remember how I found out, but I learned, I learned there's, there's, here's this story. And so I thought that was really fascinating given the song Brown Sugar and the mm -hmm. relationship that the Rolling Stones have with African-American music. And then it was, it was very interesting to me that they had, that the members of the band were also having, you know, having relationships with African-American women. And that was something that was kind of, it was kind of common throughout the, the the British rockers that there was a lot mm. of um, kind of romanticized attention to African American women, kind of you mm -hmm. know, so it's sort of yeah. problematic uh, in in certain ways. Um, so that was something just on the gossipy side that I had no idea about, and that I ended up spending time talking about because I think it actually does um, have some meaning in terms of the ways African Americans. Um, are sort of represented in popular culture and the way sexuality mm -hmm. is talked about, especially women's sexuality. So I dealt with that. I think for me, um, a few things, the artist Laverne Baker from the 1950s, mm -hmm. early rock and roll artist, I had no idea that she was so much on the sort of vanguard of promoting rock yeah. and roll around the country in concerts. Um, she was on a lot of the, the tours that went around the United States and Canada during the summers promoting rock, rock and roll to mostly mm -hmm. like preteen and teenage audiences, um, multiracial audiences. And she was the second headliner after Fats Domino. So I knew about Fats Domino, yeah. but Laverne Baker, yeah, I kind of yeah. knew her name, but I didn't know any information about her. So learning about her and learning about how she was really vocal about um, it, she was vocal in her criticisms of the, cult, the cover song thing that was happening in the 1950s where white mm -hmm. artists, wh white pop artists would cover R&B songs that had been originated by African-Americans. And because of the segregation in distribution and in the airwaves, they got more airplay and usually sold much better than the African-American yeah. originals. So Laverne Baker was really upfront and vocal about that and actually wrote to her congressman and tried to get you know, <laughs> legislation to address mm -hmm. this. So I thought that was impressive. Um, and then the other thing that surprised me was how, I mean, I, li I like the Shirelles. I think they're such a great group, uh, girl group from the 1960s, the first really successful girl group. Um, I was really stunned to find out how, 
how important their influence was on the rest of the 1960s because they really don't get a lot mm. of attention. They just kind of yeah, get lumped yeah. in like all the girl groups and the focus is on the producers on, um, you know, either Barry Gordy at Motown and his team of producers, you know, people who are producing the, the Supremes or Phil Spector uh, mm. and the Wall of Sound. But actually the Shirelles were the first group that succeeded on the pop charts, the first African-American women's vocal group. Um, mm. And they sort of, they made it possible for people to imagine like, oh, we should have more girl groups because we can sell records by these, by these artists. Mm -hmm. So it, you know, broke open all of these um, opportunities for other black women vocal groups. There are some white uh, girl groups, but it's primarily African-American mm. women. And so I was just, I was like, wow, that's, really good like good to know <laughs> um but it was also so for me the fact that they sort of showed how to merge african-american sound and pop you know pop sound like european american pop sound in a way that would mm -hmm. be palatable to the top 40 they modeled that in, in a way that allowed phil Spector and the people at motown to figure out how they could have, you know, success with girl yeah. groups. And so we get like, you know, the Ronettes and the Crystals with Phil Spector, all of the songs that Darlene Love sang on and didn't always get credit for. Um, and then obviously with Motown, the Supremes. So the, the Supremes become the, the, you know, most successful girl group. Yeah. But they were standing on the shoulders of the Shirelles. Um, mm -hmm. And then, of course, the Shirelles influenced the Beatles. And then the, you know, the yeah. Beatles are so important. So I just, I hadn't realized all of that about them. And so, you know, as I was learning these things, I felt this kind of frustration that you could get this information in bits and pieces, but it wasn't consolidated in a way that it was, you know, easy for people to access. And so people, for the most part, weren't aware of these stories. So that was, mm -hmm. you know, one of the goals in the book was to put, put the stories in one place um, so that people can access them and, and understand the the contribution yeah. that these women have made over the decades. Yeah. How did you de uh, decide on the structure of the book and who to put in and who maybe to leave out? Oh, who to leave out was really hard because there's that, like, I, <laughs> you know, it's when you're, I guess when you're doing something and you feel like a lot of people haven't talked about it before, I don't want to say this is the first book on that because there are other, definitely mm -hmm. other books, but certainly there could be more. So I felt like I, I have to talk about everyone. And of course that's not possible. So mm -hmm. I, I, well, the book is chronological. So the, that's the main structure. I start with big mama Thornton um, in 1953 and I end with Tina Turner in 1984. So that's the, the length of the, the, the time frame that I look at. Um, and a lot of the choices I made were based on not seeing a lot written about, the, you know, particular artists. So for okay. like in the 1950s, um, there are other rock and roll women like Ruth Brown and Etta James, but they both have written or they had written memoirs. And so they put their stories out there talked about their experiences, kind of claimed their space in rock mm -hmm. and roll history. And those are both really good reads also. I would recommend them to, to people to, to read. But um, Laverne Baker was very adamant that she didn't want to write her memoir. She was like, I don't want to put my business out on the street. I'm a singer. I'm, a, I'm an entertainer. I have these mm -hmm. records. You should listen to my records. That's what you need to know. And so I think as a result, she kind of gets lost because she didn't you know stake that claim so i i really wanted to put her story in and so it was making decisions like that you know feeling like when people talk about girl groups they either talk about the producers or the supremes mm -hmm. there's really not a lot written about the shirelle so i really wanted to to put them um in the in the in the center of things um there, there's a really good book on girl groups by Jacqueline Warwick, and she talks a lot about the Shirelles. Okay. But, you know, other than yeah. that, you just don't hear a lot. So it, that's the other way I was making choices. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you got uh, Big Mama Thornton, then mm -hmm. Laverne Baker, Shirelles, and, and then I, next? Yeah, back the group, background back vocalists. Okay. And then yeah. I talk about... Um, some of the women who are linked to the song Brown Sugar. 
So I talk about mm-hmm. the late 60s counterculture and the place that African-American women had there. And that for me was important because I think most people, if you ask them, were Black women involved in the late 60s counterculture, they would say, what are you talking mm. about? You know, no, Black women were in the Black power movement or the Black arts movement mm. in the late 1960s, early 70s. So I wanted to show, um, you know, really show the breadth of, of, in, of things that Black women were doing during this period in the world of music mm-hmm. and um, how I think we have such a narrow view of what Black women are interested in what their mm-hmm. voices should sound like, what music they should be engaged with, all of these things. And so the, the women who I write about um, really challenge a lot of those limits and when I, you know, in very different kinds of directions. And then I conclude with LaBelle and Betty Davis and Tina Turner. Mm-hmm. Okay. So uh, going back to the background singers, can you talk about their place in, you know, white rock? Mm-hmm. And the sound of the black, the black sound, quote unquote, black sound. Yeah, yeah. I think it becomes really important in the late '60s. It's right at the, it's right as rock is becoming whiter in terms of who the audience, or you know, really white in terms of who the audience is and who, mm-hmm. who the artists are. Uh, there are African American artists, like if you look at the Woodstock film, you've got Richie Havens, you've got Sly and the Family Stone. Uh, of course, Jimi Hendrix, but there's really like a critical mass of of white people involved and black people seem to be kind of pushed to the margins. Um, mm-hmm. But at the same time, there's still this desire for, for black sound, which is what was motivating the British, the white British artists all along. They're all thinking of themselves as playing rhythm and blues, um, yeah. like the Who called themselves doing maxim, maximum R&B. Uh, Mm -hmm. And then we just, we forget that and we just say, they're a rock band. But what they were thinking they were doing was um, kind of reproducing uh, American blues. So they wanted to, you know, keep some kind of, you know, keep that connection in their music. And I think you hear that in the vocals that many of the artists do. Sometimes we call it blue-eyed soul. But I think what they started to want was to like have the genuine thing, what they thought of as as Mm. a genuine thing. And I think the contrast that you get with women's voices and men's voices, and then, you know, these quote unquote black voice, black sounding voices and white sounding voices was something that they just really started to, to love. They really started to revel in and it becomes very popular. So the women, the African-American women are bringing, um, what they're bringing is a gospel sound. They're women who learn to sing in the church and there are certain practices associated with singing gospel that, um, mm-hmm. that are very different from the like singing, you know, I, I think as it took place in England, like, you know, pop music singing. So there's yeah. that, there's a desire for this different sound. And I think also because the recording tracks were getting really loud with um, the amplification of the guitars, I mean, all of the instruments, but especially the guitars and the distortion, that they needed loud voices to kind of cut through mm-hmm. all of that sound. Yeah. And these women have loud voices. Um, one of the things that Gloria Jones, one of the background vocalists who I interviewed, told me is that she loved the British musicians because, as she put it, they weren't afraid of us. They weren't afraid of our voices. They wanted us to sing with all of our power. And what I think she was experiencing in working with, you know, other artists, whether they were American, you know, black American artists or white American artists, there was sort of like, can you just turn it down a little bit? Cause you're making the, mm-hmm. the limiter go into the red, you know, when you're, when you're yeah. singing. <laughs> and she said that loud, that loud and that loudness gospel sound was what they really wanted. Um, and that became this desired thing. And so these women had this desired thing. Um, and I, I think of it as, it was like a, a kind of authenticity that um, mm-hmm. um, the musicians felt um, kind of just, it was, was part of black music. Like there's just this, it's yeah. more real and more true um, mm-hmm. than, you know, anything from white middle-class culture. 
And so that's a romantic idea of, of African-American mm-hmm. music, but it just happened to, you know, it worked out well for the people who, mm-hmm. who had that sound and could bring it, yeah. you know, for someone like Betty Davis, who was an African-American woman who didn't have that kind of vocal authenticity, it created problems for her because the, um, the industry wanted a certain type of sound from, from black women mm-hmm. and she didn't have it. So there were, you know, definite mm-hmm. pros and cons to those ideas about um, so- this kind of sonic authenticity. Yeah. Why do you think the British musicians were so pro, used them so much as opposed to the American yeah, ones? Yeah, well, actually, the American ones use them a lot. I think they just come to it later. Mm-hmm. They beca- does okay. become the sound. So, you know, mm-hmm. well, Neil Young is Canadian, but he was recording a lot in the States. So you, mm-hmm. you, hear, you hear them on, even on like Leonard Skinner, Mary Clayton is on the song Sweet Home yeah. Alabama. So it, it just becomes a trope that everyone is involved in. But I think the British musicians um, were coming from a different history and context. And so they're, the way they thought about African-Americans was really different from the way white Americans thought about Mm -hmm. African-Americans. There wasn't the kind of tension and um, I think maybe a kind of fear. Um, So in their relations with the people of African descent who were in England, like the immigrant communities from the Caribbean and West Mm -hmm. Africa, they weren't on really necessarily good terms. You know, those, those relations were were problematic, but they're what, and they Mm -hmm. were so focused on African Americans and, you know, like lionizing this music, really loving this music and the people who were producers of it. So it, it just put them in a different kind of relationship with black Americans. Mm. And I think for white Americans, there wasn't that level of comfort. There's, you know, a kind of, um, I don't, you know, who knows if it was guilt or just, um, it, it seemed to other, you know, you know, growing mm-hmm. up in a culture where African American culture is so marginalized talked about in such negative terms, you internalize yeah. those things, um, and are not maybe reaching out to those communities, even as you're playing music that's coming from those communities. Mm-hmm. The, British musicians didn't have that baggage. And, yeah. um, and if you listen to some of them talk, they, someone like Eric Burden uh, from The Animals talks about identifying with Black blues musicians who were working class because he came from a working class background, like grew up in a house where there, there wasn't uh, – a bathroom inside the house. They had to, ha- they had an outhouse mm-hmm. in the backyard. So the, the way class politics were work in England, the kind of working class position was sort of mapped onto black uh, Americans mm-hmm. position. So they felt a kind of identification. Okay. It's, kind of, it's a, it's a very, it's a really strange moment, you know, mm-hmm. on top of that, you have these white British guys playing black music in the United States for white audiences and white audiences thinking, mm-hmm. Oh my gosh, they invented this. These white British guys invented this mm-hmm. really cool stuff. So there's all <laughs> kinds of like misinformation and uh, you know, happening at that time. And yeah, that's yeah, yeah. what, you know, the, the, that hard rock era of the sixties, that that's so much a part of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, you'd mentioned Betty, Le- uh, Betty Davis and talk about her and LaBelle mm-hmm. and their place in the rock sure um in the 70s you know kind of coming out of the 60s rock counterculture you have these two i think of you know related but different expressions of black womanhood that are tapping into kind of 60s counterculture mixing it with african-american musical culture and then just going and you know (laughs) various interesting directions Mm -hmm. so with labelle you have them this trio of um patty labelle sarah dash and nona hendrix who had been in a girl group in the early 60s reimagining themselves as you know modern young women for the 1970s and singing about the stuff that were the things that were important to women um, being really mm-hmm. forthright about sexuality, but also talking about social issues and, and you know, political topics. And, um, 
and dressing, you know, like rock and roll people were dressing, not dressing in little matching mm-hmm. dresses with, you know, um, you know, or gowns and wigs, but going more into like natural hair and street fashion. And then after a little while of doing that, they start going really glam with these silver space costumes and putting on this kind of theatrical show that went alongside this music that they were doing. Um, Beautiful harmonies. Uh, They'd been singing together for years. They knew each other's voices well. And they, um, Nona Hendrix starts writing songs for them. So you also have them doing that kind of rock thing of, writing your own songs and performing the songs you write. Um, And they really developed uh, a a multiracial audience at a time when a lot of groups were more, had more monochrome audiences. And they also had a really devoted queer audience at a time when, you know, it was really very soon after the time that they, you know, decriminalize same-sex dancing in New York mm-hmm. City clubs. So, I mean, it was, it was not cool to be out of the closet. But LaBelle, um, their concerts created a space where it was safe. It was safe to be out and people were yeah. out and just dressed mm-hmm. up and enjoying the community that they created. So, um, and LaBelle, uh, they were singing with a style that was kind of, um, you could hear the connections to gospel and, and, and R&B. Um, Mm -hmm. With Betty Davis, she's more rooted in the blues uh, and rock and roll, like hard rock. And she was a friend of Jimi Hendrix's. She really loved Sly of the Family Stone. And on her first album, she worked with with, uh, Greg Erica, who had been the drummer with Sly and the Family Stone, as he was the drummer and the producer of the record. And so she has a different sound and feel because her vocal style is she said it's almost more like performance art and you can almost hear yeah. her as being like proto punk in the kind of experiments experiments that she does with her voice she's not trying to sound pretty she's not trying to sound soulful she's trying to sound like betty davis and um mm-hmm. she put out three records three albums um in the 70s that are i think just really fascinating documents of you know, what would happen if, if, if a black woman went out on a limb uh, yeah. with her music and with her lyrics and also with her on stage style, which, um, you know, we don't have a lot of footage of her. She was a mm-hmm. really much more underground person. So she didn't get on television. So a lot of the, you know, artists show up on uh, like a, you know, soul train or, uh, the Midnight Special or, you mm-hmm. know, the Dick Cavett show. Rock yeah, you know, something where you, <laughs> you can see them do a show. And even if they're just lip syncing yeah. to a record, you just get a sense of what they're like. But she was on an independent label and just didn't get that kind of exposure. So, uh, but it is said that she put on an extraordinary show, a very... I mean, now we, you know, now it might, might seem mild to us because we just had Megan the Stallion uh, on the, the Grammys, uh, uh, <laughs> WAP. But it was that. I mean, it was that kind of raunchiness, and yeah, and yeah. a very and like she was doing it for herself. It wasn't like she was trying to be sexy for the guys in the audience. It was just like this is what mm-hmm. I want to express. And I think, and it was, um, I think for some people, it was kind of scary to see a a woman who was not trying to like smile and be pretty and sexy. It was a different kind Mm -hmm. of, the word aggressive gets used uh, when the reviewers were were writing about her. So I think those were some very interesting examples uh, in the early Mm seventies. Those two. How much, how much do you think that was of her being a black woman? Like if she would have been a white woman being that raunchy, because her, her records didn't sell. Yeah, I, you know, I don't know. It's so hard to imagine. I mean, one thing I, I started thinking about as I was writing this was that I was thinking about who moves when they sing, like which artists mm-hmm. were, are actually in motion when they're singing. And um, so there are women at that, you know, who her, were her contemporaries who were talking about you know, like intimacy and sexuality in very mm-hmm. open ways. Like if you think of Joni Mitchell, for example, yeah. but 
she's, you know, Joni Mitchell's either sitting at her piano or she's playing the guitar. Or she, she's not, mm. she's not dancing. She's not moving. I think part of what it with Betty Davis was that she's singing about this stuff, but then she's, she's embodying it also. Yeah. And so yeah. I think that was just like, <laughs> well, that, that was a lot for, for <laughs> you know, all these different audiences. Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure like if, if a white woman doing that kind of performance would have had more latitude, you know, Madonna is, it's what Madonna did 10, Mm -hmm. 10 years later, but it was 10 years later, you know, like, you know, in the moment in, in the 1970s at that time, I don't, I don't know if it, it and it still combined a bit of commercial popness. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Madonna you know, was hiring producers and thinking of her songs in ways that were targeting the charts. I don't think Betty Davis was really thinking quite that in that focused way about, you know, mm-hmm. pop charts or, you know, even R and B charts. Cause it, I think if she had been, she wouldn't have done what she did. It, it would have been, yeah. um, I mean, it's not that they said, well, let's do a record that's not going to sell, but I think they were chasing a certain sound and feel more than they were trying to, you mm-hmm. know, get a hit. Um, yeah. And, you know, a lot of what they were doing musically sounds like what other people were doing musically as far as, you know, funk was concerned. Um, but funk in its early years was too, a little bit too harsh for black radio. Mm-hmm. And the uh, to get airplay, the funk band to dial back some of that rock edge that had been so yeah. important to them. The guitars got toned down or just completely disappeared and um, things got sweetened. And so by the mid seventies, you have a lot of funk bands getting airplay on black radio, but the sound of the music is a little bit different. She's a little bit more mm-hmm. of that early, more like funkadelic than like parliament. Okay. okay. So as we lead, you go from Betty Davis to Tina mm-hmm. Turner, right? And as for many of these women, they didn't have commercial success. Right. But what did Tina, what was different from her than the rest that came before her that made it click? I think Tina Turner, partly, you know, she'd been doing this for a long time. So she had a long career before 1980 when her solo first successful solo album comes she's had she had solo albums before that um so she had been working with ike turner um ike turner was was smart in terms of the business um understood the business was trying not to get screwed over in the business um Mm -hmm. so there, there are many many problems with him but she always would acknowledge that he he took so much about like how to do a show how to put on a show, how to work a record even, or how to work the clubs, even if you don't have a hit record, like all of these things. So those, you know, skills kept her afloat. But I think the other thing was as, you know, the, the front woman of Ike and Tina, Tina Turner uh, review, she was well known and she was really respected by a lot of artists. And those artists, um, really came through for her as she was trying to, you know, bring her career back. And and what happens is you get this kind of seal of approval from white male artists Mm -hmm. who are on the, you know, at the top of things in the rock world at that time. And I think that, so it's like, they're saying she's okay. You know what? She's really one of us. And it made it more possible for her to get a hearing. Uh, Cause at the, you know, when she's trying to get this, um, deal together her she's working with the manager roger davies who's australian who was a you know fan of the uh ike and tina turner review um she's in her 40s and so the the recording industry is like are you kidding (laughs) of an old black woman as a rock star you you know no we're not interested that was in the united states i think the other thing that's important is that she uh, roger davies takes things to england and he's putting her together with um, the sort of young white artists who are on the charts, um, new wave artists, Heaven 17 guys. And they're doing uh, like a, a, an album of covers 
of R&B covers. She didn't really want to do it. She's like, I don't want to do R&B anymore. I want to do rock. I want to be like a stadium rock person. But she, she did these songs and they did well on the charts in England. So I think her connection to England and to mm-hmm. the white British musicians, or I think of it sometimes as the Commonwealth, because there's, you know, Davies is from Australia. Brian Adams was someone who was really yeah. involved with her from, from Canada. I think those connections made it possible for her to get listened to so that they, people could hear her, the, the industry people could hear her, her mm-hmm. talent. Um, and the story is that Davies was close to getting this deal signed, but there is still some resistance uh, at EMI. And then Bowie, whose album had just come out on EMI and was doing pretty well, was meeting with his the music industry guys. And he said, well, I'm on my way to a con- You know, you can talk to me, but you got to talk to me while I go to this concert. Mm-hmm. I'm going to see my favorite singer. And they went with him, and his favorite singer was Tina Turner. And seeing her live, because her live show is you know she's amazing they're like oh maybe this would work so it was having those that was having that support coupled with her extraordinary talent that made it possible so other black women may have had you know great talent but they didn't necessarily have that network of of support that that tina turner Mm -hmm. um and i think from all reports tina turner it sounds she is a very tenacious person. I, I just heard Claudia Lanier, who had been in IKET, mm-hmm. being interviewed and talking about the documentary that we were talking about yeah. earlier and saying, you know, if Tina Turner says she's going to do something, she's, you know, she's going to do it. Don't count her out. It may not yeah. happen right <laughs> away, but she's like, that's what I saw uh-huh. working with them. She would work as an IKET for about two years. And she said, no, mm-hmm. Tina Turner, she's going to, she's going to do it. And so, yeah. It's a bunch of different things. And I think just also just that moment that MTV was available. She had a video mm-hmm. that got airplay, you know, and then she just had, she had a look. She had a great look. No one else looked yeah, like that. Look. No one else has ever looked yeah. like Tina Turner. That's the other thing. Too. <laughs> you know, everybody else had their hair all like stacked up in these ways. And yeah. Tina Turner's got this <laughs> long flowing hair. And um, she said, uh, I need the movement. I need that movement. And she said, there was one Iket who had an Afro and it, it just didn't work because mm-hmm. the air didn't move. <laughs> uh, so, and so just, you know, she has a vision too, like, like mm-hmm. how things should look on stage, how she should move. I mean, she said that Ike was dictating the choreography. I, I really, don't, I just don't believe that. It's like, when you see the <laughs> footage of them, like in little clips of them in rehearsal, she's, she's the one who's, showing yeah. how to do the steps and, you know, how to put the combinations together that, you know, that's her, but mm. she was, I think just, you know, trying to not upstage him. And so she would, mm. you know, in an interview, she would say, Oh, that's all Ike or Ike does this, but you know, let's be yeah, real. Yeah. I, don't well, know. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate in the book how you, you purposely said this isn't about her personal life with Ike. This is about, so that was refreshing. Thank you. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, cause you know, they said there are two, there are three stories of what happens in a marriage, you know, person A, person B and the real story. And so, (laughs) you know, I I don't want to try to sort through all that. And it's that thing we were just talking about, you know, getting, you get distracted from the work that the person has created as you're talking mm-hmm. about all of this personal business. And it's not that the personal business doesn't matter. Obviously it's an effect, yeah. but I think, you know, in a hundred or 200 years, people will find these recordings and they're just going to deal with the recordings. They're not going to necessarily mm-hmm. have all of the backstory. So. Yeah. Is there a, uh... Was there anything after seeing the documentary where you were like, oh, I wish I would have knew that before the book, that you would have done something differently or at it? Trying to think. I don't, I don't think I did. You know, there's probably something and I just can't, I'm trying to remember if there was something. I really, um, yeah, I really like what they did with the documentary. I think because Mm -hmm. they didn't, spend so much time talking 
about the music. Um, and that's what I spent so much time on that there really wasn't, yeah. there really wasn't that much. I just, um, yeah, I, I appreciated it. Um, no, I think I'm, I, I spent so much time on it. I'm like, no, I think what I have mm-hmm. in the book is okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's done. done. <laughs> I'm not going back. <laughs> yeah. Where do you uh, see Tracy Chapman in this yeah. place? Because the first album, you know, was folk, but then she moved more yeah. to rock. Uh, like, Tracy Chapman is another. I mean, if I had had the the sort of strength to continue, uh, uh-huh. like the next chapter would have probably dealt with. Um, I don't know exactly how it would have worked, but like Nona Hendrix going solo. Um, after LaBelle mm-hmm. broke up, Nona Hendrix was very much in the rock camp and experimental camp. Uh, Joyce Kennedy from the um, black funk metal group Mother's Finest. She's the vocalist. And then Tracy Chapman, because in the 80s, those were so like after Tina or as Tina Turner's rise mm-hmm. is happening, you have these other African-American women who are in this sort of rock space. So with Tracy Chapman, she um, is so interesting because, you know, here's someone who's totally unexpected because, you know, you had mentioned that some, you know, in many cases, um, African-American women have to sort of highlight their sexuality in order to get any kind of attention in the record industry. And Tracy Chapman did not take that path. She mm-hmm. was, um, she didn't have, she was not wearing a wig. She was wearing little, <laughs> at the time when she first came out, it was like little dreadlocks, which were very strange in the late 80s. You know, that was like yeah. people mm-hmm. like, why aren't you combing your hair? You know, that that was not mm-hmm. a really legible hairstyle. Um, and she didn't uh, dress to expose her body. So she was mm-hmm. coming in like the folk, uh, like the folk style, folk tradition, um, you know, playing the acoustic guitar and singing these kind of political or socially conscious songs. So she was in a very different kind of space than a Tina Turner. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think it was, it, she was helped along by the fact that she had a friend, uh, I guess from college, who's a a white, she had a white male friend whose father was in the recording industry. And that was how she was able to get a hearing. Uh, I think if she had just been trying to, you know, shop, a a demo i think Mm -hmm. i don't know i mean again it's not to take away from her talent because she's very talented a great voice um but it's just not what was it's she was just out of the box that black women were supposed to be in and i think that's part of the reason she was so successful with that first album because it was such a different sound and it was so refreshing and people were like Mm -hmm. you would hear it and you say what's that that's that's different you know content the lyrical content was was different it wasn't just you know romance and you know party and dance it was like Mm -hmm. issues and um but again she's someone who was in england i think her big blow up moment was at the i guess it was the nelson mandela is that what it was nelson mandela birthday celebration but in england um and Mm -hmm got that just got her um that boosted the visibility so much and and Mm -hmm. really helped her so i think you know the advice for black americans is to leave the united states and go to england (laughs) if you want (laughs) to if you want to be different if you're if you're trying to do something that's beyond the kind of usual Mm -hmm. in, in in music because they seem to be more able uh to hear it um now I'm sure that black British people would have something different to say about, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, acceptance and all of that. But for black Americans, I think it, it's, you know, just historically, it's been the way that many artists who are not in the kind of traditional rhythm and blues or soul mold mm-hmm. are able to get, get visibility. Jimi Hendrix goes to yeah. and then yeah. Ben comes back. Yeah. Is there a, a way in your research that you find, is there a way that's different between the way the black press is writing about mm. these women doing rock and white press? Um, like, or is the black press supportive of it, the art, artists who don't fit it, into the soul? Yeah, of- it depended on, maybe it depended on the period. Like in the early years, the only, 
well, there isn't even, well, the white press, I guess, would be like Billboard and, and um, Variety. Uh, mm-hmm. Ebony was very excited when, you know, the Ronettes took off or when um, Laverne Baker takes off. So, you know, Ebony, if, if, if a Black artist is doing well, regardless, or a Black mm-hmm. person is doing well, regardless of what area they're going to they're gonna cover it. Um, there was a magazine out of Los Angeles in the, I think, late 60s, early 70s called Soul Magazine. And they wrote about mm-hmm. all of these artists. If you were a Black mm-hmm. artist doing music, and even some film stuff, but really they were focused on music, they, would, they were writing about you. Um, and I think in the early 70s, there was a more, um, there was kind of more open-mindedness uh, kind mm-hmm. of coming out of the 60s uh, energy. And then, uh, but, you know, LaBelle gets coverage because they had a hit with uh, Lady Marmalade yeah. that gets them a lot of attention. They get on the cover of Rolling Stone. I felt like the Rolling Stone article um, about LaBelle, they get kind of over-focused on the sexuality stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, the women of LaBelle are sort of feeding them that, but it, um, it takes on this sort of, it, it feels, it felt to me a little, there was something about it that was a little bit uncomfortable because Rolling Stone so rarely wrote about African-American women that when they have yeah. African-American women to write about, it's just like sex, 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 which of course mm-hmm. is rock and roll. So, it, you know, it does make yeah. sense, but you know, there are other things happening. So I think, I think there's a range. I don't, I don't know that I could say, the black press wrote about them one way and the white press wrote about them mm-hmm. the other way. Okay. What I will say is that um, there were not a lot of black women writing about these artists. Mm-hmm. And I think that was, especially for Betty Davis, I think that was an issue because I think the black women who were seeing her in that time, they had an appreciation for what they were, what she was doing, but they weren't publishing mm-hmm. about it. Uh, and I think there, there are black uh, journalists like Vernon Gibbs, who I um, quote, and he was writing about a lot of more progressive or experimental African American artists in the mm-hmm. '70s, and he was publishing in Crawdaddy, uh, in Essence, and I think his crit- criticism is really important because he had he just had a different perspective, and it, it wasn't like, mm. oh, these are weird people. Like <laughs> there wasn't this this mm-hmm. distance that he, I, I sometimes mm-hmm. feel when I'm reading some of the white journalists, especially white male journalists writing about black women where they're just, they're dealing with an other and that you, you, yeah, you kind of yeah. feel that in, in some of the ways that they're, they're talking about them. Mm-hmm. On the shoulders of all these, all these women, is it easier now for a woman to go into black rock today? Um, I think, it is in the sense that there are people that they can point to. I mean, you know, certainly people Mm -hmm. can, you know, Tina Turner, you can just mention, you know, Tina Turner, you can talk about LaBelle, you know, if you look at, and I think the, you know, women like who are prominent now, like, you know, Beyonce or Jamel Monet, they are definitely standing on the shoulders of these women. And you think about, Mm -hmm. you know, like, or her and, you know, the the kinds of things that they are singing about and especially it's so interesting now with so much um sort of political commentary in the in the songs Mm -hmm. you know and also continuing the legacy of the blues women talking about you know desire um so whether it's easier i mean i think now it's harder for all musicians because the way the industry works and the way, the way you make money has changed. And it's, Mm -hmm. you know, the question is how, how can you make money as a musician? If you're not a superstar, if you're not Beyonce or Janelle Monae, if you're someone who's, you know, just trying to develop an audience and do some touring, of course, now we don't even, we can't even, you know, do live music, Mm -hmm. but I think the the digital music, the fact that we have like a, mm, a generation maybe it's more of um, of a music audience that isn't accustomed to paying for music. Um, mm-hmm. That's a real problem. Like you know, when I was growing mm-hmm. up many years ago, I was like, I'd take my allowance and I'd go and I'd buy records, mm-hmm. <laughs> but I knew I had to buy records. I couldn't, you know, yeah. the radio played some of the things I was interested in, but I, I had to, I had to spend money to get the music yeah. that I wanted. Um, and now 
you know, the money that you're spending doesn't go to the musicians. It goes to, you know, Mm -hmm. Spotify or, you know, various platforms and they pay a little Mm -hmm. micro less than a penny to these artists Mm -hmm. for every place. Like, how can you, how can you make money in that context? So I think it does, the genre doesn't matter. It's, it's more just the the whole structure of the industry. Mm -hmm. Um, But I also think that genre is probably less important to audiences now. And so that, Mm -hmm. I think that's a kind of um, a space of possibility that you can, you can kind of, go do one sound, one song and another sound, another song. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people might have some space for you. Okay. Sounds good. Maureen, this is wonderful. I love the book. Thank you so much, boys. I appreciate it. Yes. Sure. Sure. It's just completely readable and, you know, authoritative and like it never slows down. It's a wonderful book. I appreciate you, Mm. you know, your questions, Mm. your clearly read so carefully so <laughs> and Thank so you. fun talking with you about miss turner um what are your mm-hmm. thoughts about the rock hall uh thing? overdue <laughs> of course she should have been you know i love stevie nicks and no disrespect <laughs> to her but tina turner should have been the first woman to be inducted Thank twice you. Yeah. I, I, she was around long before stevie Thank nicks. you. i attended that induction ceremony and I was like, mm-hmm. cause I didn't know who was being inducted. My friend, mm-hmm. um, actually a, a, a dear friend whose book I, I imagine you would enjoy, um, Daphne Brooks, her book liner mm-hmm. notes, uh, for the revolution, okay. uh, which is about African-American women and, um, and sound and music. So she and I went and we were like, why is Stevie Nicks being inducted before Tina Turner? Like, <laughs> <laughs> what world are I, you in? It's like everyone assumed. <laughs> you know, when it came out, everyone just assumed Tina was yeah. already. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. yeah. So I, I really, I was, I had this panic moment a couple of days ago where I thought, my gosh, what if they don't induct her this year? You know, it's <laughs> like, could, that, could that be possible? Could that happen? But um, it would be really, it, it's def. I agree, definitely overdue. And yes, um, yes, with the so. documentary and the musical, it just would be, it's like mm-hmm. the perfect moment to, to do the right thing. Yes, yes, yes. And you read the book too, the Buddhism book. Yes, Happiness I'm actually you. still reading it because I got caught up in mm-hmm. having to read other things. But um, it's such a, I, I enjoy this book. The, yeah. you know, <laughs> she's, I, I think, you know, the, I think the other thing with Tina Turner is that because of the stage image, um, there might be an idea of, of her as being sort of, I don't know, like if she's shallow, I, I don't know what the image is, but when you, mm-hmm. when you read her, when you read this book, um, mm-hmm. you understand like she's such a smart person and mm-hmm she's so she's so studious i mean she's a, she's a real reader she loves to read mm-hmm. and she talks about that in the book and her you know her commitment to her spiritual practice is so inspiring and she's you know she's at this point like what i want to do now is i want to inspire people around spirituality mm-hmm. i'm not doing you know proud mary anymore yeah. i'm doing <laughs> thing and i i think that's really cool yeah, it's a great. Yeah, what it's yeah. called? Um, happiness becomes, becomes happiness you. becomes you. Yes, yes. Yeah, I interviewed uh, Tara. Right, Gold, right. I listened the, to that. The co co. Yeah. So um, yes, I have to finish the book. Are you chanting? Are you practicing her practice? I've been. I started chanting because of her uh, a little over two years now. Yeah. Yeah. I read uh, my love right. story and I started chanting. It's it's been uh, life changing. It's it's something I haven't done it. I, I'm like, should, mm-hmm. maybe I maybe I should try this. I mean, she's certainly I perfect. I mean, if you want to advertise, if you want to promote something, uh-huh. like <laughs> Tina Turner, like look at her life, look at what she has accomplished. Yeah, uh, yeah, right. yeah. And she is on the cover of Black Diamond Queens. Yes, and what she as it should. Be. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think there are many, but she is. And, and when I would talk with these other artists or read about these other artists, they always talked about her and with such great respect. So mm-hmm. I thought she was a good, really good person to, to put on the cover. And I'm glad I wasn't yeah, my choice, yeah. but I'm really glad that the mm-hmm. press agreed and that they, they went with that cover. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, where's the best place for people to keep up with you online? I do have a web. Yeah. I have a book. website, um, Maureen Mann books dot com and i've been doing events um 
really since the book came out back in the fall. So I have, mm-hmm. I keep track of those and you can also see previous events. You can click for uh, other panels and, and conversations and to find out about my other little things I'm trying to do or, or have done. Mm-hmm. And you can buy the book directly from Duke University Press, or I encourage people to shop at their independent local bookstores. Mm-hmm. Uh, the book is available through, you know, some network of uh, independent bookstores. And um, mm-hmm. otherwise you can go to that big fancy website, monster yeah. website. <laughs> that but, other place. You, know, you can support <laughs> your independent uh, bookstores. That would be, uh, that would be yes. a great way to purchase the book. Great. Great. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. It was a pleasure. And maybe one day oh, we'll meet in I person. Hope so, boys. <laughs> thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Same to you. And there you have it, my conversation with Myring Mann. Make sure you read her book, Black Diamond Queens, available everywhere. If you would like more information on this podcast, head on over to TalkMusicTalk.com for more podcast information and to stream every single episode. You can also find me on Instagram at ThisIsBoyce. And some special requests for you, please subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, Amazon Music, and Audible iHeartRadio, pretty much everywhere. Just search Talk Music Talk. And please leave a five-star rating and or review wherever you happen to listen to help expose TMT to brand new listeners. There is also a TMT app. It is free wherever you like to get your apps. Again, just search for Talk Music Talk. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time, and there will be a next time, this one's for you, Liz. (laughs) 